am very honored to be here, and I want to thank uh, Gail and Louise for giving me a tour of the library earlier today. It's truly a, a beautiful library, a great treasure of the United States, and I didn't even anticipate how beautiful it was. It was the first time that I've been here. And I thank that nice introduction that you just gave. That was really lovely. Thank you. Because I want to really talk about who I am, not so much because I'm Larry Klayman, but because I'm a product of my generation. And my generation was very much influenced by Ronald Reagan. We grew up with Ronald Reagan. He was the turning point in our truly becoming conservatives and becoming Republicans in a way that was a credit to the Republican Party. I did go to Duke University. It was during the Vietnam War. My generation was very much involved in trying to change the world. We thought we wanted to make things different. I was out of step, perhaps, with most of the people of my generation. I was conservative. I supported the war in Vietnam. Thought we should have fought it differently, just like our 40th president thought the same. But I was not supportive of the anti-war movement. And of course, that war gave rise to Richard Nixon. And Nixon had a lot of positive qualities, but he had some negative ones too. And when I graduated from Duke University in 1973, I took a year off between undergraduate school and law school, and I worked for a Republican senator by the name of Richard Schweiker, who ironically became the first vice presidential candidate of Ronald Reagan when he ran in 1976. And I remember sitting in that office, working in the mailroom, opening up letters, and seeing all the different divergent views, and we would have about 100 letters that we would send out, and I would, as the gopher, as the number one gopher for Dick Schweiker, I would go in and give him coffee every morning. Very nice man, but I would also sign his mail. We had letters, everything from left to right. Whatever the constituent wrote, we would send him back a letter that made the constituent happy. And I like Dick Schweiker. He, he's a nice man. And I'm still friendly with him. But that's what all the senators on Capitol Hill do. They make you believe that they agree with you on everything. I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to be that kind of a senator. But it was the Watergate period. And ironically, I was there signing the letters and working for Dick Schweiker while Hillary Clinton was on the Watergate committee conspiring to impeach Richard Nixon. And when that ended, I went to law school at Emory in Atlanta and went on to practice law in Miami, Florida as a trial lawyer. Not a thing that you want to brag about these days in terms of being a trial lawyer. And in the course of my 17 years of legal practice, I went to the Justice Department and worked in the antitrust division. I helped break up AT&T. I went against big drug companies that were fixing prices and raising the pharmaceutical rates for consumers. And I left and ultimately started my own law firm in 1983 in Washington and later with an office in Miami. And that law firm represented small people, medium-sized businesses against the powers to be in Washington. And I saw how money corrupted, how money influenced decision-making, whether it was in government agencies or whether it was in the courts. And it changed the result. I had to be tougher and meaner in a nice way than my colleagues at the big law firms in Washington because my clients didn't have the money, and I wouldn't let them anyway, pay off American officials to get a good result. I once had an Italian client, because I was doing international trade, that we got a good decision for. And he calls me from a congressional office. I said, what are you doing up there in that congressional office? He says, well, I'm writing a check to the congressman. He made a good decision. I said, get out of there. You're not supposed to be doing that. But that's what happens in Washington. And that's what I saw during my career there. Then came Jimmy Carter, following the Watergate period. Carter a well-intentioned man, but someone extremely naive, who brought us a Rangate, lasted for over a year. Unfortunately, he also brought us Ted Koppel, who's lasted decades. <laughs> but we know what happened with Carter. The interest rates went to 21%. The country almost collapsed. And our national sense of pride and self-worth was destroyed 
because this was somebody that hesitated. And because of that, in 1980, we had elected the greatest president of our lifetime, Ronald Reagan. And we have to thank Jimmy Carter for Ronald Reagan, ironically. Because at that time in history, a conservative never would have elected if we hadn't had a liberal as bad as Jimmy Carter. So God was looking in on us when that happened. And that influenced a lot of us. Uh, we had a sense of purpose. We had a sense of, of self-worth. We had our pride back. We had somebody that could communicate with the American people, someone that was as good as the American people, someone who was an optimist, who had a can-do spirit. One of the reasons I love California and I love Miami, Florida, and all of Florida is because there's a can-do spirit in those two states. Our two states are very, very similar. And it's no mistake that many of my supporters are in California as well as in, Cal as well as in Florida because these are states that don't say no, they say yes to things. They're not closed. It's not the old way of thinking. It's a new way of thinking. And Ronald Reagan brought that to the country. And Ronald Reagan had as his objective the, not just a question of bringing back the faith of this country in itself, but to end the evil empire. Tear down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev. We see part of that wall out here in, in the library. And it's a beautiful thing. And he succeeded because he had a sense of purpose. And he had a resoluteness. And he had a strength to him. And he succeeded at that. And of course, we went along in the 80s and we prospered a great deal. Ultimately, we had uh, Bill Clinton come into office and that was around the same time that, and we're talking of course there was an interim president, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, but we had the misfortune, obviously countries go in cycles and the country swung back to the left and we had a Bill Clinton, but by 1994, as a trial lawyer, as someone had seen, who had seen the corruption in the legal profession, someone who had seen the dishonesty among lawyers not being able to tell the truth, and judges who would make decisions not on the basis of merit, but the vested interest that could scratch their backs and get them to a higher position, I had had enough and I started Judicial Watch. And Judicial Watch was set up as a government watchdog, in effect a private justice department because the Justice Department wasn't policing p corruption. Uh, the Justice Department has never policed corruption in government, particularly against its own. And the Clintons were in office. What could be better for business <laughs> than having the Clintons office in office when you open up an anti-government corruption organization? <laughs> so we had a little market niche. And for eight years, Bill and Hillary Clinton committed one crime after another they made Watergate look like just a warm-up session. It was amateur hour compared to what the Clintons did. Over 40 scandals, everything from using presidential uh, trusts to raise money, which you're not supposed to do when you're in office, and everybody in the Clinton White House did that, to the Chinagate scandal, which I uncovered through John Wong, and it sparked the biggest scandal in American history only cut short by Monica Lewinsky because the media likes sex a whole lot more than they like bribery from communist Chinese. <laughs> the Filegate scandal, I did not uncover that one. That was the House Re Government Reform Committee, but we filed a lawsuit which continues today. Hillary Clinton is a defendant. And, of course, there was Travelgate and there was Pardongate. And I took a nice tour of the library here earlier and I saw those nice presidential gifts which Ronald Reagan took legally the way you're supposed to take them with permission rather than Hillary Clinton who stuffed them in her suitcases and left and, and stole everything she could get her hands on. And it struck me after 10 years of fighting the Clintons and other corrupt politicians that we had a situation where the country was really on the decline, where our sense a purpose that was built up during the Reagan years had been destroyed. Where we no longer trusted the President of the United States and his First Lady, and we no longer trusted anyone in government. And it was for that reason that George W. Bush was elected because he was an antidote to Bill Clinton. People didn't know who he was. They didn't know, 
like they do today, that he's the person who is capable of fighting the war against terrorism. I would like him to be stronger, but he's done a good job fighting the war against terrorism. And over those 10 years, because it's now 10 years that I was chairman of Judicial Watch, I scored one victory after another. We were the only ones to have gotten the finding that the President of the United States, regrettably, Bill Clinton, had committed a crime. Ken Starr didn't do that. Judge Royce Lamberth made that ruling in the Filegate case when he found that the files of Kathleen Willey, which were released by the White House to smear her, that's one of the women that Bill Clinton harassed in the Oval Office, that the release of those files was a crime and therefore I was entitled to get evidence of a pattern of similar conduct to Filegate because Filegate concerns releasing Privacy Act protected materials just like occurred with Kathleen Willey and that was evidence of the intent of Mr. Clinton to destroy people with FBI files and he had tried to do it with similar government files in the past. But I learned over those 10 years that despite all those victories, that Judicial Watch <clears throat> was very effective in getting and all of the information that we had released to put a damper on illegal activity, such as with the Clinton's house in Chappaqua, New York. When Judicial Watch moved to block that, when Bill and Hillary Clinton got an illegal loan from a bank, Deutsche Bank, not coincidentally the same bank that funded the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, tells you something about the Clintons. When we found that out, of course we stopped that. When we filed a lawsuit against taking monies illegally from a state farm to pay legal defense funds, we stopped that. And Judicial Watch accomplished a lot. But I did a lot of soul searching in the last year or so. <clears throat> and I came to the conclusion <clears throat> that just like Ronald Reagan, when he said, we will end the evil empire from without, we will fight the Soviet Union, we will fight against communism, we will take it down, that I too will fight an evil empire. I will fight the evil empire of corruption, the corruption from within. And that's what I've been doing for 10 years, but it must be taken to a higher level because we can see the consequences of that corruption. Despite the fact that Judicial Watch scored all these successes over the last 10 years, we were just a fly in comparison to the corruption in Washington, D.C. and around the country, and for that matter, around the world. That corruption continued. And despite the fact that we elected a president like George W. Bush, who's basically an honest man, and Dick Cheney is vice president, the corruption continued to grow. The corporate scandals of Enron and WorldCom, the stealing from people like yourselves. And he's the president because he later became the second president of the United States that I admire as much as Ronald Reagan. Because he said that you can change your forms of government and your rulers many times, but without pure virtue, morality and religion, you will not have liberty. And that's what I started thinking about in the last year is that despite all of my good efforts at Judicial Watch, and my colleagues as well, and I give them much credit, we did not score the knockout punch. The corruption continued to increase even under the Bush administration. Not because the Bush administration was corrupt, it's not. It's generally honest. But the momentum that has built up over time from Watergate to what happened during the Clinton years has created a mentality in this country where corporate criminals in business with politicians, and many of these politicians sit on the board of directors of these corporate criminals, could destabilize an economy to such a degree, coupled with 9-11, that we went into a tailspin, which we're suffering from even today. And because the president was preoccupied with 9-11, because, frankly, both political parties had punched themselves out, we did not address these problems. And that is why. I decided to run as a senator from Florida and to leave Judicial Watch, which I did two weeks ago. Because I believe that I must now take the fight inside of government. Not to overdo the corporate analogy too much, it was like a stock split. Judicial Watch continues in effect and it's very strong and I support it. And it does extremely important work. But if Larry Klayman at age 52 can now go inside the Senate 
and fight the corruption from within like a Trojan horse, to use the investigative powers of the federal government, of the Senate, which are considerable, like Richard Nixon investigated Alger Hiss. I will investigate Hillary Clinton inside the Senate. And when I do take that oath, and I'm sitting down next to Hillary, I can't wait to see her face when I'm sitting next to her. And you know, in the Senate, you rotate. You take turns in presiding over the deliberations. And when Hillary Clinton gets up to speak, I'll tell her to sit down and to listen. And like Ronald Reagan when he said to Mikhail Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I'll say to Hillary Clinton, Mrs. Clinton, remove your veil of corruption. But it's not just Hillary Clinton. We have a lot of things that need addressing on Capitol Hill. And it's not just corruption, it's government waste. Last year, we spent millions of dollars on a Cowgirls Hall of Fame. Ronald Reagan would have had a field day with that. Remember when he came to Congress with all of the tax laws that were burdening us? Well, I come from a state that doesn't have any income tax, Florida. We should have that throughout the country. There shouldn't be income tax here in California either. And I'm not only going to be the senator from Florida, but I'm going to be the senator of, of the conservative movement, much like Tom McClintock was getting support from around the country because people recognize the importance of California. I hope that people will recognize the importance of Florida because Florida is the swing state. It's going to be the swing state in the next election. And we need to continue the fight against communism. I've been fighting against Fidel Castro, who has continued to persecute not just his people, but as a terrorist threat, 90 miles off the coast of Florida. And we need to move against the large interests, labor unions and corporations, that fix prices, that divide markets, that prevent the American spirit from taking effect. It was Ronald Reagan who pointed that out to us time in and time out, how the government was usurping our values and controlling our lives. And I would like to be the senator of free enterprise. And in that regard, prescription drugs. If any of you can figure out what our drug legislation is, please let me know. I would like to figure it out before I engage in some senatorial debates. But I think the easier thing to do would be to simply break up the drug cartels, and I want to work on that. And then I want to help the elderly. I want to help the elderly like I would like to help the unborn. The unborn, of course, are forgotten in this country, but so too are the elderly. It was, not, it was no less than five minutes after I announced for the Senate in Florida that one of my opponents, a Republican opponent, attacked me, saying that Larry Clayman could never be elected by the people of Florida because he sued his own mother. And I said, well, that's good. I want to talk about that. I want to tell you why, why I stood there for my grandma. I had a grandmother who broke her hip, who was 89 years old, and Jane Chastain, my very good friend in the back of the room, came to my defense when this was going on. And it was a tragic situation where my stepdad had taken all of my grandmother's money, my mother had dementia, she didn't even know what was going on, and my grandmother was abandoned by my stepdad and by my, step, and by my mother and others. And then, during the course of the convalescence, because they didn't go to visit her, I took her with my wife to Washington, and we cared for her in a home there and put her in a hospital. And one day I found out that a do not resuscitate order was put on her charts at Georgetown Hospital, a Catholic hospital, which believes in life, it's supposed to believe in life. But nothing was done, and she was left there all alone. And my mother, who couldn't care for her because she herself was not well, couldn't do anything about it. And I had to step in. I had to get my grandmother's money back. I didn't have a lot of money because I was running a public interest organization. And I had to get the do not resuscitate charge off her charts. And I had to go into court to do both things. And with regard to the do not resuscitate order, uh, as my grandmother's blood pressure was slipping after many months of convalescence with a broken heart, that no one was coming to see her except her grandson and her, her granddaughter, I had to go into court to try to get that removed. 
and I filed an emergency petition as my grandmother's blood pressure was 49 over 100, and she was going downhill. The judge assigned to the case walked off the bench on a Friday afternoon like a government worker and never ruled on the case. And I, when I called her at home, as my grandmother was dying that Sunday, she wouldn't take the call. And then chastised me for calling her at home. I got a letter a few days later after my grandmother had died. Well, it tells you that our society is very callous, not just with regard to the unborn, but with regard to the elderly. And we've all had family experiences like this in one manner, shape, or form. And when my opponent used that for political fodder, I said, great, let's talk about that in the state of Florida with elderly people that have come there to be treated with respect. And I had started a foundation called the Respect Foundation to help elderly people, which you'll hear about more and more into the future. And that's something that we need to take care of. We need to respect elderly people. Not just preserve social security. Certainly, we don't want to take risks with that. A little bit of private enterprise is good, but we see what happened to the stock market. We may need another solution. We not only want to remove the caps on Social Security so elderly people can make money like everybody else and aren't limited. Ronald Reagan would have done that for sure. But we want to make sure that they live their lives in peace. And in that regard, none of us these days, whether you get up in years or whether you're in your middle ages or whether you're young, can live our lives in peace because of the threat of terrorism. Last year, I co-authored a book, Fatal Neglect, the U.S. government's continuing failure to protect American citizens from terrorists. And that was written one year before the 9-11 report. One year before. And in that book, we detail how whether it is the Immigration and Naturalization Service, or whether it's the Coast Guard, or the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, or you name it, all of our government agencies, that while the line agents and the government people at the lower level tried to do their jobs, their superiors, frankly, were out to lunch, giving themselves high fives and taking home fairly nice salaries and going on vacations because we weren't prepared for 9-11. And even today, despite the efforts of the president and the Republican Party, that bureaucracy remains entrenched. And we need to do something about that. In Florida, like in California, we have 1,800 miles of coastline. Anyone can drive a private yacht into the port of Miami or the port of Los Angeles. The Coast Guard calls out, does a cursory check. If they think that you're not from a foreign country in a terrorist state, you can come right in. And if you're carrying biological or chemical weapons or nuclear weapons, you can detonate that device and there she goes. We in California, as we in Florida, are highly vulnerable to that. And we need a senator and I'm not uh, asking for your vote, you can't vote anyway, so this isn't a, a political speech, but we need a senator that really can see the classified information. I couldn't do that at Judicial Watch. Now I'll be able to see it. And someone that will put his foot down. We have a crazy senator in Florida by the name of Bob Graham. Perhaps some of you have heard of him. He is the cousin of Catherine Graham, may her soul rest in peace, of the Washington Post, one of the most leftist newspapers in the country. And Bob Graham has gone around the country calling for the impeachment of George W. Bush. I mean, can you think of anything more absurd, particularly given the fact that he was head of the Intelligence Committee leading up to 9-11? He knew or should have known that we were in deep trouble. And in the course of going a little bit crazy, he also appeared in front of the NAACP and said we need to have laws that allow criminals to vote. Well, I think we already have laws that allow criminals to vote. Clinton and Gore did just that during the 2000 elections. They voted, and they're criminals. So we have a lot to do in the field of terrorism. And one of the proposals that I'm going to make when I become senator is to put on license plates visa expiration dates. Because in Hollywood, Florida, not to be confused with Hollywood, California, most of those Saudi terrorists got into the country with phony visas. In fact, the ringleader, Mohammed Atta, came right through the Miami International Airport and didn't have a visa. They gave him one on the spot. If he had a license, he was carrying an American license, which said when that visa had expired, perhaps he would have been caught. And why do we allow people into this country from terrorist countries? We're in a state of war. What is the logic of that? So for every country except Cuba, and you can't blame the Cubans for Fidel Castro, 
we should add Saudi Arabia to the terrorist watch list, we should be in a moratorium now and not allowing any immigration to occur. These are the kinds of things that we need to address. These are the kinds of things that if we had Ronald Reagan as president would be addressed right now. And we need that courage. We need that courage to clean it up. And most importantly, you've got the president of the United States right now who's uh, had a very high popularity rating, but that popularity rating has slipped in the last few months. And why has that happened? This is the residue of the Clinton years. The, the reality is, is that we have destroyed so much the public trust that whenever anything comes up, whether it's a question of whether Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, or whether it's a question of whether or not corporate scandals uh, were part of uh, a lack of due diligence by the Justice Department, that the people start to lose trust very, very quickly. And that, in effect, is why we need not only to fight the evil empire from without, and we still do have a communist threat from North Korea, from Cuba, from other countries in the world, but we need to fight the evil empire from within. Because unless we have that honesty, unless we have that sense of morality in our government, the people in times of crisis are not going to follow. And you can see the effects when even an honest president like George W. Bush is paying the price of eight years of Bill Clinton. And when the press just jumps on him, and when the Democrats are able to make the hay that they're making now over the war in Iraq. So that is why I'm setting sail for new colonies. That's why I'm leaving Judicial Watch, my little baby that I love so much, and I hope you continue to support. Because we need to fight a dual front war. We need to take it inside of the government. And we need to turn the government against itself, just like I turned the legal profession against itself at Judicial Watch. I hope that uh, you'll take with interest what I do. I will be the senator not just of Florida, but the senator of everyone in this country. And I will not kowtow to the powers to be. I'm not going up there to wear gold cufflinks and to prance around and to sit there comfortably on the Judiciary Committee with Ted Kennedy as he pontificates on how we have destroyed the federal judiciary. Well, that's another thing. The federal judiciary, we need another way of selecting judges, the best and the brightest. That'll solve a lot of our problems. Because right now, we can't select anybody. There's gridlock. So there's much to do. I look forward to your support and your help. If any of you would like to assist us in any way, just even ideas, let me know. I have some cards I can give them out. But this is not politics here. I didn't come for that. I'm very, very honored to be at the Reagan Library. I'm very honored to be in the presence of the 40th President of the United States and people that honor him on a daily basis. And I'm very honored to be in California, which is one of our most important states. You have my pledge that I will tear down the wall of corruption and this time, we will score the knockout punch for the American people. I'd like to take some questions.